got to be in pictures You're wonderful to see You ought to be in pictures Oh, what a hit Hello and welcome you to Deep Dive Movie pictures. Reviews with my friend Steve Hackman and myself, James Marsh. This week we are doing Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinitz is Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. But before we talk about that movie, if you haven't already subscribed to Deep Dive Movie Reviews, just go ahead and hit that button. Hit that subscribe button. Doesn't cost you a cent, and you'd be doing us a great favor in the algorithm to be able to get Deep Dive Movie Reviews out to more people. And if you want, you can even ding the bell next to it, and that way you'll be alerted whenever another video drops. Also, be warned, Deep Dive Movie Reviews does contain spoilers. James, let's talk about everything, everywhere, all at once. I've been really excited to see this film since it premiered at South by Southwest earlier this year. I have heard nothing but incredible things. And, uh, you know, with cinemas closed in Hong Kong, it was infuriating. Uh, thankfully, no sooner did the cinemas reopen than everything everywhere all at once was quickly put on the schedule and it is coming out next week at the time of recording. But we've been lucky enough to see it. And... Uh, what is it all about? Okay, so essentially is the story of Evelyn Wang, played by Michelle Yeoh. She is a middle-aged Chinese immigrant working in somewhere in the U.S. I don't think it's uh, specified exactly yeah, where. It's just know. every town, yeah. USA. And she runs a laundromat. Uh, she has a sort of meek, hardworking husband, played by Ki Hoi Kwan. Uh, her her father is flying in, played by the great James Hong, and so the, that is uh, imminent. She's planning for his imminent arrival, and she has a rather wayward young daughter in her early 20s who has just brought her girlfriend home and is rejecting all kinds of family plans for the new year and for grandpa's birthday uh, when she gets slapped with a massive tax audit from Jamie Lee Curtis's Inland Revenue Auditor. Uh, as everything is compounding, compiling, and seemingly uh, insurmountable, another version of her husband materializes out of nowhere and says, we need your help, quite possibly, to save the world. James, like you, I couldn't wait to see this movie. When I saw the trailer a few months ago, I, I was like, Michelle Yao, multiverse, multiple choices, resulting in multiple uh, paths, and, and watching this go together with, with uh, uh, really kick-ass uh, martial arts going on uh when i saw james hong i'm like big trouble in little china baby <laughs> sign me up in fact if anything i like this movie so much there's only a couple small critiques i have and i'll start off with one like you couldn't have one cameo by kurt russell that would have been just <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> that would have been nice that, that would have, have been, been nice, nice. Sure. see you know i'm just trying to think outside the box daniels call <laughs> me up man if you need to think outside the box a little bit it's it's not that they didn't already think outside the box amazingly i was gonna this, say in this movie the, arguably there is no box no, there is no spoon there is no everything bagel no and yes <laughs> and the whole, <laughs> even the whole idea that everything bagel was just it was spot on it was perfect it was so so well done and you know we just recently reviewed the uh, doctor strange in the multiverse of madness and i, I gave that up yeah it was okay you know i gave it i think a three out of five and this movie hits the elements I was looking for in that movie, uh, but it happened in this film because it really demonstrated the multiverse as something as, as helping us understand who we are as humans, the choices mm. we make, the impact it has on ourselves and the lives around us, and, and getting into psychological and philosophical questions about nihilism and what is ultimate truth and does anything really have value is is there an objective value in the universe our notions of love and compassion and joy and peace are these are these universal truths or are they just merely concepts that we devise for ourselves this movie addresses those elements whereas in doctor strange the multiverse is really just a you the multiverse itself is just used kind of as a a tool for another superpower for, mm. you know, and it, it never fully, you never fully get to unpack what the multiverse is. Now, maybe in Marvel, they plan on doing that in future movies. But for me, they were able to do it in this one single movie with Michelle Yao and everything everywhere all at once. 
Yeah, I mean, the timing has been both sort of great and terrible for for, for Daniels, as they are called collectively. Uh, I read that when they were actually sort of sitting down to write and plan the script originally, it's when Spider-Man uh, Into the Spider-Verse, the animated film from a couple of years ago, came out. And Rick and Morty were also dealing with the multiverse. And they were like, oh, no, you know, I, it's almost like they've, they've not they've stolen ideas, but we're now going to be seem irrelevant or passe by the time we get this movie made. So they're like, we're going to stop watching Rick and Morty. We're going to stop doing all this. And then when the film finally comes out, it comes out like hot on the heels of Spider-Man No Way Home, you know, which which fractures the multiverse and shows a numerous possibilities of what it can mean on that massive uh, canvas of a superhero franchise. And we've only seen that explored, explored all the more in in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. What was so good about how it happens in Everything Everywhere All at Once is it wasn't about the fate of the universe. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about how uh, superheroes can utilize parallel versions of themselves in alternate realities or, or the gimmick of seeing, uh, you know, just, just superhero tropes and character tropes with which we are so familiar just being turned on their head or reinvented in... Um, in sort of humorous but ultimately quite superficial ways here it's all about it's grounded in such a sort of small intimate human story it's about one person who has not lived the life that she wanted to live i mean i can only speak for myself but i imagine everybody at some point every day is is plagued by oh well, what if i had yeah what if what if i had gone on that date or what if i had called that girl back or what if i had taken that job offer or what if i hadn't screwed that interview up or what if i had gone out with my mates yesterday like i said i would you know every day there are just these minuscule little decisions and sort of branches crossroads that we come to you know all day every day and what this film does is it really addresses those and says that yes each time that one of those happens it 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 changes everything it changes the whole universe. However, what we are going to enable this one person with is the ability to access all of those possibilities, all of those um, different versions of your help, of yourself. Yes, on the one hand, because they're going to we're going to tell a really fun, action-packed kind of adventure about what might have been, but to hammer home the fact at the end of the day that you are all of those people. You know, regardless of which version of yourself you are living, you know, whether it whether it is the the middle aged laundromat owner or whether it is the glamorous sort of uh, movie star or whether it is the martial arts uh, practitioner or, or whether or it's even the hot dog fingers, you know, hot dog fingers, sushi yeah. chef, whatever it yeah. is, you are all of those people. They are all of the attributes that got those people to where they are and seemingly living the better life that you are coveting. Yeah. It's all in you. And you can access and channel any of those skills at any time. Very well said, James. I just want to jump on that, uh, what you just said, because a 59-year-old Michelle Yao is the perfect age to address this existential dilemma. Because like you mentioned, everybody asks the what if question. Let me tell you someone who's a little bit older than you in his 50s. And Michelle <laughs> Yao is in her 50s. When you get in the 50s, you know, there's more, there's undoubtedly more years behind you than there are in front of you. And so these questions start to really materialize. And you can see having Michelle Yao at her age, it, it's, it's, it's important for a film like this to have someone at that age because one, they've got enough years behind them that there's a number of regrets. We all have regrets. And by in your 50s, they've accumulated a bit. But there's still enough years in front of you for the redemption to occur. And obviously what we see in this film is her coming even, it, it, it's ironic that what makes her the, the, best, the best able to uh, correct this abnormal, uh, abnormal ab anomaly anomaly <laughs> what what ironically what made her the best capable to address this anomaly in the universe obviously doing battle with her very own daughter is the fact that she's the worst version of herself she's the version who's made pretty much every bad choice more or less and now she has so much more ability or, or such a baseline to be able to to rise up to 
And, and so there's, there's kind of that, uh, that aspect of the film I really liked. I love that you used the word gimmick. That was the word I was looking for earlier to try to compare the use of the multiverse in Doctor Strange versus the use in the Daniels movie here. In, in this movie, it feels like a real tangible element that is being used to as a device to explore what it means to be human. Whereas in the multiverse, it was a gimmick for superhero powers. And it was mm. much more effective in this movie. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, talking about what, what you're saying about when you get into your 50s, well, the way I sort of anticipate it or understand it as somebody in their 40s is that you know, you, you're, you're almost on the back nine, you know, you, yeah. you realize that you've got, yeah, fewer years left than you, than you have enjoyed already. And so it becomes, yes, your life is full of regret. Yes. You've got more bad decisions stored up in the back, like hopefully some good ones too, but you know, you've got all those missed opportunities or perceived missed opportunities. But when you look at what's left, you're thinking, I don't really have time to, to wipe the slate clean and start again. Mm -hmm. But what I, yeah, but what I can do, like, I like what you said about redemption. I've got, I've got time to fix maybe some of the things that I've done mm -hmm. wrong, the, the decisions that I've made poorly that have impacted other people negatively. But I think it, one thing it reminded me of in, in a way was um, the worst person in the world. You oh, know, when right. she goes to see uh, her ex who's now dying of cancer. And although he's relatively young, he's probably about my age. Uh, he now has that profound sense of hindsight. You know, he knows he, that there is nothing now ahead of him. All he has, all he can do is look back on what he has achieved and attempt to kind of fix some of it in this very short window of time. Whereas dur during the, the, the majority of that film, she has that kind of youthful, carefree attitude to life, which is, I don't know what I want. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm just finding my way and, you know, when when needs must, I will I will mm -hmm. hit hit the right line. I'll find the right path. But uh, I'm I'm going to freestyle mm -hmm. for now. And what I felt uh, the Daniels do incredibly well in this film is they make all of those different realities feel tangible, feel so close that you can at times very literally touch touch mm -hmm. each other. You know, there are a number of moments where characters in one multiverse will like reach through and smack like smack a character in another in another reality which you don't really get in this kind of grandiose pomposity of the sort of the marvel multiverse you know it's all very much about like oh look he's blue now or yeah, or something yeah. like that it's just a kind of topsy turvy thing whereas this hammers home how um tenuous all of these d different choices are and how sort of minuscule and incremental the, the compounding sort of decisions are. And, and all one needs do is make one little adjustment here, one little adjustment there to steer you from one, from one possible future into another one. It's interesting you made the connection with The Worst Person in the World because another film that I was connecting this film to, particularly when it came to the relationship between Michelle, uh, Michelle Yao and Jonathan, Jonathan Kwan. <laughs> Jonathan Kirkwan, Ki Kwan. Short uh, round. Key Kwan, short round, <laughs> short round from Indiana Jones with in the Temple of Doom, which it was wonderful to see that aspect. But no, I connected this to Peggy Sue Got Married, the Kathleen Turner movie oh, from yeah, right. I think the 80s, where through some circumstance, she she's obviously she's in, she finds herself in the same position that Michelle Yao is in at the beginning of the film, that she's been married to her husband for many, many years. Familiarity has bred a, a measure of contempt. And you don't you don't hate that person. You're just starting to ponder. Obviously, Michelle Yao, she sees a romantic couple in a TV screen and she's she's thinking about romance. And then she looks over at her husband and there's there's little to no romance, not realizing he's getting ready to serve her with divorce papers because mm. he he's feeling the exact same thing of constantly being judged by some kind of standard, which he's never going to be able to to rise up to. And Kathleen Turner and Peggy Sue got married, had the same thing where uh, she has, she goes back in time and she has the opportunity then to, you know, date the old high school flame, to, to take the path not taken. But then she comes to realize that actually these are the choices she made. And she's got to learn to live with the choices she made. And actually, they weren't as bad a choices as she's made them out to be in her head. She just needs to view them through a different lens. 
and mm. and there's a real redemption there. It's a wonderful film. And and I found a lot of similarity with this because at the end, really Michelle Yao hasn't changed anything other than her perspective has changed. Absolutely. Her attitude, her perspective, you know, rather than looking around and and blaming her predicament and her situation on every, on sort of everything and everybody except right. except herself. You know, and it's I loved how it all came back to her relationship with her father and how that is am, it, impacting her relationship with her daughter mm -hmm. and how uh, the film acknowledges that, uh, you know, traditions uh, and attitudes have changed from one generation to the other, but how she is sort of protecting, see, she sees that she's protecting her daughter from her, from the traditional attitudes of her father by lying to her father about who who her daughter is and what right. her daughter is when her daughter has no intention of doing that wants to be open wants to be honest going this is me i'm very proud i have no hang-ups about it and actually as it turns out the grandfather really doesn't have an issue with it either and it's mm -hmm. it, it's all michelle Yeo's, yo's perception or evelyn should i say her perception of you know trying to appease both generations mm -hmm. but uh, but ultimately appeasing nobody yeah, and, and I don't think any culture is immune to those kind of family dynamics, but you and I living in Hong Kong, I think mm. it's it's a, within a lot of Chinese culture, we saw a lot of that played out in this film, and it was not unlike the recent Pixar film, Turning Red. I was about they, to say, yeah. Okay, yeah, where it was very much the same dynamic of the grandparents the parents and the children and the miscommunications and the misperceptions and the expectations laid on and, and both real and imagined and mm. how this builds up and builds up and builds up into a very dysfunctional relationship, which is what we see until you look at it with a new perspective, which, you know, most of us don't get the, the opportunity to, um, engage in the multiverse like Michelle Yao's <laughs> character did, but watching her journey, helps us in ours oh for, it really does you know i came out of this film you know in a in a very sort of strange way sort of came out of this film going yeah i can do i can be better i can do this better you know there, there are small things small situations you know i i don't need to pick a fight with my wife over where we're going for dinner i don't need to you know not that i do you know i'm a saint of course of course so you're but, just using uh, an example of but yeah, it's, purely, it's purely hypothetical that's situation. Right. it's a thought experiment but it, but I, it did um, put me in that frame of mind, mm -hmm. you know, be be better, look, look for the positives. I mean, I think I'm a fairly optimistic person mm -hmm. generally anyway, but it, the film really did have that effect on me. But the film is in no way preachy. I want to get that out of the way. You no, know, it's, no. it's so much fun and it's so creative and chaotic and inventive Uh that you're just kind of swept along by it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's obviously, it was, it was, it was sort of amazing. I know we keep harking back to it, but it was amazing seeing it kind of in the same week as I saw uh, Dr. Strange, mm -hmm. because it's using obviously a minuscule budget, uh, but it is addressing the same issues, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, in, in some quite uncanny, uncanny ways at times. Um, but it's doing them in a far more sort of lucid and profound way, I think, because it humanizes these issues. And it says, well, how, how are these tools going to be used by an individual in order to better their very specific situation? And that's what I loved about the film. Speaking of creativity, James, I can't understate the level of creativity I found in this film. When they were, when the mother and the daughter are in a universe where no life existed and they're just two rocks yeah. with, with essentially text messages going between the two of them, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. I, I was so engaged with that scene alone. I, I think if I was already loving the film, but when it got to that scene, I just thought this is something that goes so far beyond anything in the Doctor Strange film. Mm. This, this is truly creative. This is this is two rocks in a desert. There's no CGI. There's no <laughs> explosions. There's no mutant monster rampaging the city. It's two rocks having a conversation, a mother and a daughter. And I was totally engaged. 
Oh, sure. And, you know, and that's the conversation they're having, you know, because they have been through a number of different realities together and, and it's quite near the end of the film. But uh, Evelyn is saying, OK, we're here. So what do we do? And uh, her, her daughter, Joy, is saying, no, that's the whole point. We do nothing. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to say anything. Well, you can't say anything. You don't have to go anywhere. You just exist. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was it was one of many kind of fairly profound philosophical points that the movie raises mm -hmm. uh, just about well, it, about sort of nihilism and about sort of the meaning of life and what is important perspective and just the importance of stopping every now and again and taking a breath and reassessing what am I angry about? What am I upset about? What's important to me? And am I prioritizing the right things? Yeah. And I think, I think that that's what the film does so well. One of the elements that this film shared with Dr. Strange that I did really like is how at the end, the good triumphs over evil, not through overwhelming force. My force and my violence is bigger than your force and your violence, mm. but through peace and a counterintuitive way of engaging. Compassion, love, you know, this kind of embrace, a, a powerless power. And, and ultimately in both films, the, the good, good overcomes because it refuses to engage in the very principles that are threatening, that the other side is using to threaten the universe or creation or the world or whatever. But it's, it's, it's a much more subtle and powerless engagement. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the acknowledgement that nothing matters, all, the, all of her hangups, all of the things she's angry about, nothing matters. All that matters is it's kind of family, mm -hmm. our, our loved ones are enjoying, you know, the, the, the crux of the, the argument between Evelyn and Joy it comes to a head when it's like, you know, what are you, what are you so mad about? You know, why, mm -hmm. why are you so angry? Nothing, none of this matters. None of this is important. And she, and it's when she concedes that, yes, you're right. None of this is important, but all that matters are these tiny little moments that we get to spend in that nothingness together those we can get some sense of meaning out of those moments and those are the moments that are most important exactly it doesn't matter whether you're the martial arts action hero mm -hmm. the the sushi sh sushi shelf shelf <laughs> the sushi <laughs> chef the woman with the hot dog fingers or you know half a dozen other uh incarnations of michelle yeah what's important is uh have you learned to love well Right, exactly. I liked how cine literate the film was as well. I mean, there's a it was a huge debt to like the Matrix, and it's quite yeah. uh, upfront acknowledging. Yes, you know, it its starts references. with a choice. I mean, there was a whole Morpheus thing at the beginning with. Uh, yeah, yeah, it starts with a choice, and the first kind of showdown is hiding, running through the cubicles, hiding in an office. Because yeah. it's kind of the whole thing goes down in one plane of reality, goes down in the I local IRS offices. Yeah, you know, the entire movie kind of takes place in the IRS building where they are being audited and Jamie Lee Curtis, who plays the sort of deranged uh, Deirdre, who is their <laughs> auditor. You just got to love in Jamie this Lee great, Curtis. It's, in this great sort of over the top kind of fat suit and hot fright wig. Uh, she's absolutely wonderful. You know, she adds another layer uh, to the film. She gives, she, she gives sort of a face to the antagonist. Of course, she's not the only antagonist. The real antagonist is actually, um, joy as well or another incarnation of joy a sort of all-powerful malevolent being called jobu tupaki <laughs> and i love the play on jobu i didn't know if that was from major league but there's a big meme from those of us that are baseball lovers of the jobu uh from the movie major league with Charlie oh yeah Sheen. it's like a yeah. kind of voodoo doll kind it of is thing, isn't yeah it? yeah i pray to you jobu you know you know answer F you, yeah. Jobu, you know. <laughs> I do. I, I know Major League very well. Yeah. And so there's a big Matrix thing going on in there. There's a wonderful Ratatouille gag. Yes. That goes yeah. on far longer than I thought it ever would. And it and it works. And it even it even has a satisfying c conclusion of its own. It has mm -hmm. catharsis in and of itself. And then, yeah, there's some other movies that we have, we have mentioned already, uh, not least sort of Turning Red and what have you. Um, but 
and obviously it takes into account the legacy of Michelle Yeoh as a as a performer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's in some res one of the alternate realities is essentially Michelle Yeoh. Mm -hmm. You know, she is this glamorous Chinese actress uh, going to the premiere of a, her new martial arts movie. Uh, and then it kind of there's a one car Y element in there when, um, you know, she is not with, i got to say, the wonderfully named Waymond, okay. Waymond yeah. Wang. And I want to get back to that in a minute. Uh, they are estranged in this particular reality. But he is the most debonair, slick kind of Leung Chui, Tony Leung Chui esque uh, incarnation of himself, you know, in, in the immaculate suit and the slick back hair and the glasses. Uh, and it's as much about them reconciling after being away for so many years. Um, and there are even moments where it uses footage from Michelle Yeoh on red carpets at real festivals, you know, in the, in the beginning there. And so I really, really sort of appreciated all of that. Apparently the role was originally written for Jackie Chan. Uh, yes, I had heard that. Yes. And then quite early in the process, they decided, no, no, you know, this is going to work much better with a woman. And so they actually rewrote it, calling the main character Michelle. And the idea was, OK, model it on Michelle Yeoh. She'll, well, she won't do it, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, and then she obviously did do it. And one of the things she said was, OK, but let's not call her Michelle because this this woman is not me and needs her own story. You know, and I love Jackie Chan. I love Jackie Chan films, but there would have been a different tone if oh, it had yeah. been Jackie Chan in this rather than Michelle Yao. Well, let's let, let's be honest. Jackie Chan's not not half the actor <laughs> that no. Michelle Yao is and this no. needs yes. what I what this needs a performer with versatility, with gravitas, yes. with with nuance who can separate all of those different uh incarnations of of herself with a deft touch and i think she does that incredibly well here so i do want to talk about wayman wang good because yeah. i just think that that's brilliant i mean mm -hmm. th this is great this is the great comeback of uh k hoi kwan yeah. who we all know as jonathan k kwan for as short round in indiana james and the temple of doom and data from the goonies who after that really didn't find many roles and ended up sort of retiring from acting pretty much entirely about 30 years ago um, he actually went into stunt coordinating for a while. And so when you see him do his martial arts in the film, as is obviously also the case with Michelle Yeoh, they're doing it themselves. You know, that's them doing doing the, the Kung Fu, and which is which is absolutely great. But it's it's brilliant that he has come back. And I think he's we are going to see a lot more from him in the future. You know, the tide is turning roles for Asian American actors uh, of, of any age are obviously far more prevalent now, you know, and there is a real surge in, in popularity for that right now. And that's all great. But one of the, I just loved the fact that, that he was called Waymond because I mean, let, let's handle this delicately, but, but, you know, matter of factly, um, K. Koi Kwan, Michelle Yeoh to a degree, you know, and other, other performers have, you know, something of a slight soft R, should we say in the, in their pronunciation. And so, I just assumed, you know, his name was Raymond Wang. And then on the divorce papers, you see it written and it's never, it's never addressed in the film at all. There's never a conversation about how, you know, yes, that's just the way it's spelt or that was a typo or this was an error, you know, in the, in the divorce papers or whatever, his name is just Waymond. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was, it was just so, it was, it was just funny, you know, yeah, it, but yeah. in a, just a nice, you know, soft, gentle kind of, uh, but poking a little bit of fun kind of way. And I just thought that was great. And and I also agree, and I'm sure that the Daniels and, and any, everybody else involved will have similar stories to that. I, I knew a girl in Hong Kong who was called Maloney. Her name was Maloney. She told me that it was supposed to be Melanie, but her dad wrote it wrong on the birth certificate. He spelt it M-A-L-O-N-E-Y. And uh, she just decided to keep it you know, and so and, and to pronounce it that way. But it was supposed to be Melanie, but it was Maloney. So this stuff, this stuff does happen. And I, it was it just tickled me. Well, you know, uh, you and I living in Asia, uh, we are confronted with a number of our, our Asian friends, some of them with names that should have been vetted by a first language English speaker first. This is very true. <laughs> this is very true. Yes, there were some egregious errors yes. <laughs> that we have come across. Um, over the years but uh 
yeah and and he's such a he's so good i'm so glad that he has come back into the fold and i didn't realize he was short round until after i saw the movie and i was doing a little research on the film okay and then suddenly i'm going oh my gosh that was short round i couldn't believe it so uh yeah i i was pleasantly surprised afterwards what i love is that he's now like 50 or something Mm -hmm. and he sounds exactly the same well, now I, I'm wondering why I didn't see it because mm. now it's like, oh yeah, of course, because you're right. The the voice inflections are very similar, even though it's it's older. He's old. Yeah, he's older I mean, now. he's he's still got this kind of pretty high high pitched voice with yeah. the with the speech so slight lisp and speech impediment, and he sounds exactly like he did when he was kind of twelve years old. You know, yeah. doing uh, doing Indiana Jones, and it's and it's brilliant. And I'm sure we will. See. And he's and he's good. You know, really, most importantly, you know, he can play the the husband who seems a little unsure of himself. And then he can play the husband who is suave and debonair. Uh, He he played just a lovable character. By the end of it, you're thinking, why are you not in love with this this man? You know, Mm. and uh, of course, in the end, obviously, she she does see that again in him. Uh, I want to mention, though, also the I just love the use of the the language in this, even the daughter yeah. being named Joy, there is just this metaphorical uh, thing that's happening every time she's racing around trying to find, give me back my joy. Where is joy? I want joy, you know? And you realize this is a girl who's, not, uh, Michelle Yao is a woman who is not just trying to find her daughter Joy, but mm. is really trying to find joy. This is a woman who we see at the beginning of the film who lacks any measure of joy whatsoever in her life. She lives in a world of regret and misunderstanding. And by the end of it, she finds her joy. Yeah. And and it also sort of um, illustrates the the sort of the pressure that was put on to the daughter joy mm-hmm. you know she was called joy she was like you are going to be the the most beautiful thing you are going to be the thing that makes me happy for my entire life you know and as we know in, in sort of chinese culture you know there, there's the phrase that you have children so that they will look after you the mentality is you have children so that they will look after you when you're older and that so that separation has a sort of a, another degree of i, I can't let my, this girl go i can't let the, her escape but yeah, it's it's this great sort of um, signifier of uh, what what is missing, yeah, what is absent, yeah. uh, and and jealousy to a degree that she has the the freedom and the individuality to to define who she wants to be and to be herself. You know that she had the luxury of growing up in America, you know, as a teenager and defining her identity in a way that Evelyn ne- was never allowed to. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know and only you know and and that because she grew up in it's not exactly i'm not sure if, it, if it's hong kong or if it's china i think it's you yeah. know she speaks to her dad in cantonese but then she yes. speaks to her husband in mandarin mm-hmm. and i thought that was brilliant mm-hmm. the way the way that they go they switch from one language to the other to another you know in the and space I of a sense i knew enough that i could understand mm. some of it <laughs> yeah no for me too and the, and the way that the english is phrased at times you're just like oh that's bang on yeah, because yeah. nothing grates more. Well, actually, one of the things that great. Let's just be nice. One of the things that grates with me a lot is when you see characters in in a English language movie speaking English, and you, and it's the character's second language, but they're using, uh, you know, compound stru- sentence yes, structures yeah. that you're just like. Why, why are you making them talk like that? And it's because well, the writers just said, well, I need them to say this. It's like They would never say it like that. They would no. say it in the most broken down, simple way possible. And what this film does is it really embraces that side of, of how uh, people can, how people speak when their English is not perfect. It's not that they just say it funny. You know, they, their, their whole grammar is, is it's, different. It's different, and yeah. And it's so authentically realized here. Mm-hmm. I really, really, I really appreciated it. I love it. You know, and, and added to that, we were kind of talking about it earlier, is some of the cultural uh, pressures that I think you and I are familiar with, with some of the things that happen in Hong Kong with, with the number of tiger moms. You hear the phrase, the tiger mom. Sure. And in this, essentially, the they use that tiger mom as a plot device to uh, where Michelle Yao in the, in the alpha verse fractures 
fractures Joy's mind by putting so much pressure on her. And I'm thinking of how many young people, their, their minds just get fractured because of the expectations and the loads and the, uh, the weights that are placed on these young people that they're, they're not ready to have. And they, they just pop. So it's very much addressing a social issue that uh, many people are familiar with, particularly in this part of the world. Oh, I, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I imagine there's a huge amount of sort of autobiographical or biographical content in there that speaks uh, to the directors and the writers. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. Dan China isn't isn't Chinese, but, uh, but, Daniel but Kwan, speaks, I think Daniel Kwan. Is, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. And speaks to his experience and his family and, and growing up um, as a migrant family in the US where you've got, you know, that other that other facet of it as well being that you are trying to operate in a in a community in a society where uh you are deemed you are perceived as as being other mm -hmm. the, the whole time and when you're not always as welcome as you might be anywhere else it just adds another layer to it and um i think it's just all handled with such a degree of authenticity and and empathy and and humor you know there, there is so much humor in this movie yeah, yeah. all the way through that it's it's kind of relentless you know it's exhausting and, and exhilarating in the best possible way i found you know i've heard some people uh, complain that it was a bit long and i mean and i looked at the runtime ahead of time and it is it is like 139 minutes or something and i was like i was like oh okay this might outstay its welcome but for me it to it didn't at all no no it was paced well i never once felt wow i just i'm looking at my watch and want this to be over um, I, I think it, I, if I have a small critique with it, James, you know, when we did our uh, top five films, we would take on a deserted island. I mm. mentioned contact and contact for me is part of a genre that I really love movies that celebrate the wonder and the existence of what it means to be human, the, the bigness of creation, these types of things. Uh, you know, for me, it's like uh, uh, Terrence Malick's Tree of Life, it's contact. It's uh, 2001, 2010, Interstellar, these movies that are big and help us understand what it means to be human in relationship to the universe. And this movie almost touches that level for me. One of the things that kept it from getting there, and, and admittedly, the other movies that I mentioned are not comedies, and this is a comedy, but there's a there's a measure of crassness in this at times, which is just too much for uh, not too much for me, but it mm. keeps it from it pops that wonder element as, as soon as the guys are going around trying to stick butt plugs in their asses so that they can fight. Uh, suddenly, my my wonder of the universe has popped for a second, and I feel like I'm watching a film written by two guys who met in uni and thought, wouldn't it be funny if we had these guys trying to stick bug plugs in themselves so they could fight better? You know, in that moment, that admittedly there was some humor to it, and when Jamie Lee Curtis shows her her trophies, and everybody is like, oh, just, yeah, you know, the second of, you see those trophies, I'm like. They look yeah. like butt plugs. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna they're gonna use that. That's a little foreshadowing there, which eventually we we find out that is the case. It's a minor critique, mm. uh, and it, like I'd said, admittedly, it, it was pretty funny, but it kept it from going to that transcendent level that I find in some films for me. And so, see, for me, I think for me it, that really kind of touched on the Hong Kong sense of humor. Because if you watch if you watch Hong yeah. Kong comedies, yeah, you know they they are pretty they're pretty lowbrow. It's yeah, pretty smutty. Yeah. You know you yeah. got Stephen Chow who does all his um you know it's very, very language. It's very physical. He yeah. does physical, but he he kind of does a bit of language based comedy as well. But a lot of Hong Kong humor is scatological or mm -hmm. sexual in nature yeah. or or yeah very physical. A lot of slapstick, obviously, which obviously uh, actor like Jackie Chan did bring into his uh, martial arts a lot, and so. Those elements, when they, uh, you know, they, they are to one degree perceived as sort of out of place, you know, with the with the rest, but that sort of added to the kind of kaleidoscopic, all encompassing, everything bagel, you know, yeah, yeah. The sensibility of the movie and the specificity of the kind of humor that they used. I was like, oh well, yeah, this is kind of classic, yeah. uh, you know, Hong Kong slapstick sort of toilet humor, and so I was yeah. I was okay with it. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it. Yeah, like I said, it's a it's a minor critique, and by and large, I was okay with it. It just was, it kept it from 
going to that 2010 trio life level for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'll be perfectly happy with that. I think you they'll know. live. Yeah, I think they'll 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 not go as- all the way to the bank with. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. I'm not convinced that they were aspiring to that, that, that anyway. No, no, that's uh, that is definitely a personal thing for me. So James, what uh, instrument should we be using to, uh, as the standard here for? Well, I mean, we could say hot dog fingers, but I think we've kind of shown our hand a little bit. Do we, I think we, do we not have to uh, have to do butt plug shaped uh, employee of the month trophies, trophies, auditor of the month trophies? Okay, let's, let's do uh, butt I think plug we shaped. Have to. Auditor or go- of the month googly trophies. eyes if we want to be family friendly, but I don't think I don't yeah. think we need to be if, if somebody friendly. has listened this far into our mm. talk, I think pet be rocks, you know, pet rocks. Yeah, Let, let's no, go. We're going with butt plugs, we're going with yeah. butt plug trophies. Let's, yeah, there we go. There we go. So, James, how many? No, I was gonna, I was gonna, oh, okay, you're to going you to first. me first. Okay, go ahead. So, Steve, how many butt plug trophies are you going to give everything everywhere all at once? Uh, James, I've just said about every nice thing I had to say about this film. It's excellent. It's wonderful. I can't wait to see it again to take Tammy. And and this is a movie I want to see again. I loved this film. Michelle Yao was fantastic. Cass was wonderful. It just, it ticks so many of the boxes that I would have liked to see more in Doctor Strange and the multiverse of, in in the multiverse of madness. But, Mm -hmm. uh, But it kind of failed to reach that level. This film did achieve it so everything everywhere all at once i'm giving it four and a half butt plug shaped <laughs> auditor of the month trophies all righty all righty uh yeah i mean i want to echo everything you said i think i uh, you know i've been very vocal about how much i liked it mm-hmm. uh you know i saw i remember the daniel's first film because they came out of uh, music videos mm-hmm. and they made a movie in 2016 called uh, swiss army man with Paul Dano and Daniel Radcliffe. And if you haven't seen that, that's about a man um, marooned on a desert island. Paul Dano is marooned on a desert island with only Daniel Radcliffe's corpse for company. And uh, he finds it a very useful tool in the wilderness. And I'll leave it at that. And it's and it's as nuts and, as, uh, and it showed all the promise that this has now, this film has now realized that all of that potential and then gone, gone stratospheric with it. Um, I thought I thought it was fantastic. I realized I've actually been fairly generous and positive in uh, the last few reviews that we've done, you know, and I've been sort of scoring quite highly, which I don't think I tend to do normally, you know, but um, I think right now this is my favorite film of the year so far. Yeah, I can't I think it's, I would say it is mine as well. I think I can't think of anything that I've seen that is that, that is better you know, a couple of things which might be, you know, in the same ballpark. But uh, I th- I think it's brilliant. I Again, I can't wait to watch it again. I think it's a film that I will go back to again and again and again. I think it just rewards on so many levels. And I think you're going to spot more little sight gags and little moments uh, on repeat viewing. And I, I hope that's the case. And I can't wait to do so. So I'm, I'm going all in. I'm, I'm, I'm going all in. And maybe that's not the best phrase to use i'm going five butt plug shaped auditor of the month trophies out of five so you're going all in with the butt plug i'm literally that guy who leaps from one side of the office to the other in order <laughs> to lands to oh, land squarely that, i think i just went ah! <laughs> <laughs> that's that's me on this movie <laughs> fantastic and uh i i certainly uh, can can understand that so Anyhow, that's going to wrap it up for this episode of Deep Dive Movie Reviews. If you haven't already subscribed, just like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, please just go ahead and do it. Be great. James? Yeah, let us know what you thought of Everything Everywhere All at Once. Have you had the chance to see it? You know, how did, Where does it rank in your films of the year so far? Did you hate it? If you hated it, let us know why, you know, so that we can block you. No, but we want to we want to know fair and balanced com- conversations and all that. I'd be very curious to hear your criticisms of it. Uh, and yeah, while you're here, you know, leave us a comment. And while you're here, check out some of the other videos that we have on our channel. We are doing every best picture. We're going through all the Oscar best picture winners from the very beginning right to the present day. Uh, and we've also covered a number of new releases, including the aforementioned Doctor Strange and um, Spider-Man No Way Home and many, many, many more. So please take a look at those. Hey, until next episode, have a good night. Have, have Goodbye. a good night. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> See you at the movies. <laughs> See you at the know. movies. <laughs> you are so big in pictures. You're wonderful to see. You are to be in pictures. Oh, what a hit you would be. You're